Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Carlin. I'm the coordinator of the Consortium for Mindfulness and Legal Education. And I'm very pleased to be joined here by Professors Angela Harris and Rana McGee. Um, I want to welcome all of you who are watching this event live, and also those of you who will be watching this um, on demand after the event. Um, today's webinar is entitled Making Mindfulness Available to All Through Diversity, Inclusive Teaching, and Compassionate Learning Communities. Um, I'll just say a few words of introduction about the, the program and about our speakers, and then I'll turn it over to our presenters. Um, so first I'd like to thank the Frederick P. Lenz Foundation for American Buddhism, which is uh, a generous sponsor of our consortium and of this webinar series. And I'd also like to thank our two distinguished speakers who made the time to be with us here today. We're very lucky to have two of the real pioneers of this work uh, speaking with us today. So um, uh, I'll say a few words about our presenters. Rhonda McGee is a professor of law at University of San Francisco School of Law, and she was a past co-director of the Center for Teaching Excellence at USF. Uh, her scholarly work <laughs> and teaching focuses on race law and policy, as well as on humanizing legal education and the practice of law. She has taught courses on torts, race law, and mindfulness in law, both at USF and here at Berkeley Law. And she is a highly sought after speaker and teacher at conferences and retreats nationwide. Um, to my left, Angela Harris is a professor of law at UC Davis King Hall School of Law. She's a leading scholar of critical legal theory, examining how law sometimes reinforces and sometimes challenges subordination on the basis of race, gender, sexuality, class, and other dimensions of power and identity. She created one of the early courses on mindfulness and law at the University of Buffalo School of Law <laughs> called Mindfulness and Professional Identity, Becoming a Lawyer While Keeping Your Values Intact which she also teaches at UC Davis, along with courses on critical race theory, food justice, and others. Before coming to Davis, uh, Angela was a professor for several years at Berkeley Law, where she received the Rudder Award for T Distinction in Teaching. So we have uh, two very accomplished and distinguished speakers here today. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to them, starting with Rhonda, who will lead us in a brief meditation. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you, Angela, for sharing this presentation time with me. And deep thanks to everybody um, out there in webinar land who's uh, taken some time to be with us uh, today. I'm going to quickly set my clock here before I forget, um, because we do want to make sure we are <clears throat> mindful of the time. So um, I just want to invite us into a couple of minutes, maybe, just a simple sitting and centering practice to guide us as we settle in and transition together into this. I sort of often think of these presentations as mini learning communities. So I'll think of this as a invitation for us to kind of join together consciously uh, in uh, a focus on this topic of um, bringing mindfulness into diverse um, legal education settings and enhancing both teaching and learning um, and a sense of community. So what I'll do is ring uh, this bell. Um, uh, those of you who practice meditation, maybe some of you have not, know that um, it's not uncommon that a bell be used uh, as part of um, a kind of a, as a device to help center. Obviously we don't need one, um, but I'll go ahead and just use this uh, bell to support us in focusing for a few minutes together. Now ring us in and out. <clears throat> So sensing into the sensations of just bringing the body to rest and the mind to rest together. And 
kind of alertness and a friendliness as we check in with ourselves as a ground for this work we will do together. So noticing the feet on the floor, the points of contact between the body and the ground beneath you. So depending on how and where you're sitting, you may have your feet on the floor and the bottom's flat on the floor, which is a really, really good way to physically sense the way in which the points of contact between the feet and the floor are really there to support you. And then perhaps gradually moving the awareness up through the legs, noticing the points of contact between the buttocks and the either the floor if you're seated on the floor or the chair, or however you're sitting, just noticing points of contact as you rest. Allowing the mind to rest on the sensations of just breathing in and out. And I invite each of us here in this learning community to call to mind a, a motivation for being here, what brought you here to this space, to this opportunity to reflect together on the work of bringing mindfulness into legal education for more effective teaching and learning across diverse settings. What draws you here? And if you will, just revisit that question to see what deeper motivations, intentions may arise for you. And may we each hold our deepest intentions as we enter into this interactive, engaged conversation together. So thank you, thank you all. Um, um, what I'd like to do in the time that I have remaining is simply let me sketch out a little bit of how it is that I see this work to bring mindfulness into legal education as actually being quite central to um, the objective of uh, enhancing teaching and learning uh, in the classrooms that we face right now, which are, as we all know, it right, goes without saying our classrooms are incredibly diverse uh, along every dimension. Um, and those of I've been teaching for 17 or more years, the years start, the number starts to blur as the, as the years go by. <laughs> but for those of us who've been teaching for some time, we, we know that not only are our classrooms becoming more diverse, but the sense that we have that we have an accountability. Uh, uh, agenda, a kind of a, a responsibility to meet those each of the students that we encounter where they are as well as we can, 
and to create spaces that really support them in their development. That, that sort of sense that, that we have a responsibility to do that is something that is becoming more and more, I think, a part of the literature around teaching and learning uh, in the 21st century. Our students um, expect, uh, and I think reasonably expect, uh, more from us in the way of creating spaces where they can learn as effectively as possible. Um, so what I'll be doing is talking about how I actually see uh, a mindfulness-based approach to teaching and learning as really, um, really central in many ways to this objective of, again, teaching for the 21st century and teaching for effective um, uh, learning uh, in light of our, our, our you know, increasing diversity. And I'll talk about, first, the research around um, um, just sort of how you maximize effective teaching and learning in diverse settings, really sort of describe some of the ways that um, research in social psychology and the psychology and, and sociology of knowledge and learning is really helping us um, understand better what the challenges are in our classrooms. Um, in particular, I'll talk about the theory and practices of inclusivity and identity safety as two concepts that have really been um, explored quite um, extensively in social psychology over the last decade or so. And um, want to incorporate the body of knowledge around that more explicitly into our work in legal education. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about, again, the way in which I see contemplative pedagogy and practices as a really important support for that work. Um, I've, I'll be looking down a bit. I've drafted um, actually a paper that summarizes uh, a lot of what I want to offer here. Uh, actually lays it out in more depth than I'll be able to offer in these introductory comments. Um, so after I've revised it a bit, I'm very happy indeed, um, more than happy to circulate this paper and get comments from those of you who would be interested in sharing uh, some of your thoughts on the topic with me and uh, incorporating them as best I can into this project as well. So I guess um, to kind of get sort of bring us into this conversation with a couple of scenes from some classes um, might be a good way to sort of make vivid what it is that I'm talking about in terms of um, how it is that these developments in education theory and pedagogy um, around inclusivity on the one hand and mindfulness-based pedagogy on the other are creating opportunities for us. I think very real opportunities for us to make our classrooms more engaging and more effective for all our students. So um, I teach this semester at the University of San Francisco, I'm teaching uh, two classes. I'm teaching torts and it's a very traditional tort law class, it's about 75 students or so. Um, and uh, it's that traditional setting, theater style, me down in the so-called pit. Um, and we meet twice a week for about two hours each. Uh, and what I have been doing in that class to try and get to know these students who are coming from a range of different backgrounds, um, most of them relatively recent graduates from undergrad, but some of them, um, you know, in their early 30s, early to mid 40s. So there was an age range among other t differences. Um, people from all different parts of the world, um, very, as we know, the typical range of different uh, educational backgrounds. Um, and, and yet, it is an important objective of mine to get um, our students engaged with each other as much as they might uh, be focused on being engaged with me. So, um, off, and, 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 and similarly, it's important for me from the contemplative pedagogy side of it to create opportunities for students to develop a, a capacity for introspection, for um, centering on the uh, inner dimensions of the learning experience for themselves. Um, what uh, is meaningful, most meaningful for them as they engage with what it is that will be deemed most meaningful for them to learn um, in terms of the objectives of the course. But so really uh, both trying to uh, emphasize that 
there is a social and emotional and relational dimensions of the class, just as there is an intellectual sort of um, cognitive dimension of the class and um, creating opportunities for them to both engage with each other socially and emotionally, actually, um, a bit, learn a little bit more about themselves right in the midst of that classroom as they learn more about the substance of Torah law, and, and at the same time give them space to reflect. So um, I, I regularly begin my classes with a couple of minutes of, of, of gently guided, if not silent, meditation. Um, I don't necessarily call it that, uh, but I do, but they know that's what it is at this point. It's an opportunity, as I tell them, to transition consciously into the space, to settle in and um, call to mind what they know about the topic, what, what we've been studying, recall where we were at the last session. And really, I give them an intentional uh, invitation to um, reconnect with the material um, uh, and, and, and pause to enable that in a kind of a conscious way. Where were we at the very end of class? What have you learned about the particular topic at hand? Let's say for now we're focusing on difficult duty issues. Um, what are some of the questions that you have? Really inviting them to reflect on what, it, what their intentions are for that classroom setting at the end. And then in addition, at, uh, almost once a week, um, I have been uh, for the last uh, year or so, consciously creating opportunities for them to engage with each other. Obviously there are many different ways um, that, if, that all of us invite sort of um, student interaction in our classes. Um, the traditional legal you know, tour class experience is often much more focused on student to professor, one-on-one -on -one Socratic questioning, and I definitely do that. Um, however, I also give them what I call uh, quizzes. I actually use the phrase seven by seven quiz, partly because San Francisco is roughly seven by seven square miles. I want them to realize they are in a particular place at a particular time that is also a part of what I see as the contemplative pedagogy agenda, connecting students quite literally with space and time and geography and one another. So I give them these seven by seven quizzes. There are seven questions. I give them about seven minutes. Um, I begin with instructions for them to begin answering questions on their own in silence. And these will be questions that are often quite straightforwardly substantive. What was the issue? in um, the Tarasov case, um, what are some of the public policies that were being debated by the, by the justices as they resolved that case? Um, what did you think of the resolution? Um, was it the right one? If so, why? If not, why not? And then I invite them, um, after taking a few notes on those types of substantive questions um, relevant to the conversation we're going to have together, I then invite them to turn to a neighbor and I each time try and get them to turn to a different neighbor and um, check in with that neighbor about, for example, what they thought about, um, what they saw as the issue, just to sort of see how differently they may, have be framed, they may be framing the issue. And then check in a little bit about what they thought about the resolution of the case, what public policies might have been most salient to them, et cetera. At the end, I often, very often, in fact, always close with a question that is, much, a little bit of a unusual question, you might say, less substantive, much more about what did you learn about this person that you just had a quick conversation with? And the question may be, what's, the, what's one positive thing you've taken away from this interaction about this person? Um, what did you learn about the way this person is approaching the, the reading and thinking um, that may, in a way that might be a little bit different from yours? Um, so just by that example, you can see how it is that um, part of what I see is the important um, uh, uh, contribution that a contemplative approach on the one hand and a focus on um, inclusivity and identity safety can offer. And, by, and what I should say is by inclusivity, what I mean is, um, you know, this sounds like a word that comes from everyday life and it, and it is, but it is also a word that's become uh, a term of art within the um, educational uh, and learning theory uh, discourse. Um, it's basically the idea of creating spaces 
uh, where every student can learn as effectively as possible. And, um, and it, I will say that the term actually arose originally out of um, the literature around creating spaces for mainstreaming students with particular uh, disabilities. But it's been much more broadly expanded um, over the last decade to include both domestically here in the US and internationally this idea that um, educational institutions have an obligation to create um, a space in which all students can learn and in ways that attend to the relational dynamics of the class, um, the social and emotional climate of the class, um, and really sees it as our part of our uh, a salient objective of ours to create, to do what we can anyway, to do what we can to create classrooms where every student can feel safe and can learn as effectively as possible. And I use the word safe, um, which is related to this, con this, this concept of identity safety, uh, which is also a, a concept that comes out of this literature. And the idea is that one of the ways, and, not, and again, we're just scratching the surface here. There's a lot more to be said about this than I'll be able to say in these opening comments. But one of the ways that um, classrooms uh, can be made more um, inclusive is to create classrooms that are more safe for people in terms of identity, um, social, uh, if you will, uh, uh, identity. And by that we mean those salient identities that have a, a social and cultural uh, impact uh, uh, and can lead to a sense of inclusion or exclusion in a particular space. Um, so um, the literature around identity safety has emerged in response to a lot of information about the way in which stereotype in particular, uh, but other sorts of um, biases, if you will, can um, negatively in impact the learning environment. And so this, uh, the, the, the research done by Claude Steele, in particular out of Stanford and many others, um, but Claude Steele wrote, wrote the book that um, many people associate with this, this, this growth in this field, uh, Whistling Vivaldi, uh, how stereotypes affect us all and what we can do about it. So that stereotype threat uh, research just show, points out how it is that um, stereotypes can um, influence the way in which people perform in a classroom, in a value setting like a classroom, not only classrooms, but wherever uh, a person is um, given to believe that some aspect of their social identity may um, be in, may be related to or to show up in the task before them in such a way as to confirm perhaps a negative stereotype about them. And so this idea of threat, it, stereotype threat is the idea that some social identity category um, may in fact, uh, again, show up in such a way as they seek to perform a given task um, about which they care, a valued task. Um, this identity may show up in such a way as to um, confirm whatever negative stereotypes might be in the air about um, them in that setting. And so many of you are familiar with this idea of stereotype threat by now. We know that there's a lot of research that shows that these threats can impact um, uh, minorities in different settings, uh, African Americans um, across higher education. We've seen the evidence of stereotype threat um, depressing actual performance, derogating performance as compared to what would be expected without it. Women, for example, in STEM disciplines, um, excuse me, there are lots of different ways, actually myriad ways by now that um, stereotype threat has been confirmed in research. And so identity safety is this idea that we want to create spaces where stereotypes have less of an opportunity to, to degrade performance. And specifically, the theorists around this have talked about how important it is to make diversity an explicit value, to support the building of relationships between and amongst co-learners in the setting, um, to, as much as possible, create spaces where learning is student-centered, um, and to and as, as, as is appropriate, in ways that are appropriate, make um, caring visible, that we care about what we're doing in the classroom, that we actually care about each other um, in appropriate ways in the classroom as well. So these are some of the main domains of what's been called identity safety in, in the research. And so 
I could say a lot more about these kind of inclusivity and identity and safety um, factors that the um, scholarship around um, effective teaching and learning for diversity has helped make more salient in my mind as I think about how to make my classrooms more effective. But I want to turn to saying a little bit about then how contemplative pedagogy, I think, assists in um, some of these objectives around um, identity, safety, and inclusivity. Well, I, most of you on this webinar are probably um, very familiar with the movement to bring mindfulness into legal education. And so I, I, would, I don't, uh, I, I would leave for another conversation, kind of a broad introduction to it. But I will say, as many of you know, the objective of many of us over the last 10 years or so has in one way or another been to bring um, contemplative practices, not only mindfulness, but certainly including mindfulness um, into uh, legal education um, and for some of us as well, law practice. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about mindfulness in particular, partly because we're sponsored fortunately by the Berkeley Initiative for Mindfulness and Law. Um, but um, again, I see mindfulness as one of a number of different contemplative practices that focuses on, again, this sort of melding of the inner and the outer experience as part of what we do when we learn. And so um, mindfulness, again, just using that uh, very popular term, we know it's the name that's given to, on the one hand, um, a set of practices that uh, aim at increasing awareness of the present moment, of our broader reality, um, uh, a definition by John Kabat-Zinn that's often uh, repeated in the discourse around um, professional interventions that include mindfulness. It really just focuses on it as being um, a way of paying attention in a particular way, uh, non-judgmentally, um, with a certain sort of attitude um, and intention an attitude of flexibility, openness, uh, and friendliness, and the intention to bring more awareness to one's own experience. And so there are practices that enhance that. And there are also, um, that ultimately, many folk who practice mindfulness find themselves uh, entering into a state of being uh, that is characterized by mindfulness. So mindfulness, on the one hand, is a state, set of practices, but on the other as a kind of a state or trait, a way of being with reality uh, with a bit more flexibility and, um, and perhaps even compassion. And so um, there are many ways that I've been seeking to explicitly, again, as indicated by the description I gave of what I do with my torts class, create opportunities for my students both to practice some contemplative um, practices uh, have some opportunities for mindfulness, um, sitting, uh, reflecting. Um, and also, I've engaged, at least in the torts class, in these various ways of having them pair and share and reflect um, that help create a more effective sense uh, and experience of community in the classroom. But there are many other kinds of practices that I write about in this paper. paper that are explicitly aimed at tackling some of the big challenges of teaching effectively in diverse community. Um, first, the practices, of course, help deepen focus and concentration. We know that the literature around mindfulness has really underscored that as a benefit. Um, also, increasing capacity for dealing with strong emotion. And whether we're dealing with torts or in some of the classes Angela and I teach dealing with race, the regulation of emotion is often also a very important aspect of what Ideally, we can do more effectively together and we can support our students in doing more effectively. And so there are particular ways that I think these mindfulness practice can be intentionally brought to bear on the piece of the class. And again, it may be more or less a piece of what you're doing in a given class. That is about helping build a deeper capacity for managing emotion more effectively as a means of helping us learn and work together more effectively. Um, mindfulness, of course, also has been associated with assisting us in taking one another's perspectives more effectively, which is related to empathy and compassion. 
two very important um, dimensions, I think, of working more effectively around diversity and in, in around issues of social justice. And um, lastly, I'll say um, there's, again, a lot, a couple of important, I won't say a lot yet. There is some research particularly looking at the way in which mindfulness-based practices support this, um, some of the sorts of objectives I've, la I've laid out. One is a recent study um, on mindfulness meditation that looks at how it may reduce implicit age and race bias. We know that, again, stereotypes are associated with this broader uh, social cognitive um, literature around implicit bias. And we know from a lot of the research how actually uh, pervasive implicit bias is amongst all of us. So this recent study by Adam Luke and Brian Gibson just came out at the end of last year. Um, we can make available uh, a reference to this. Um, that looks at how even a very short mindfulness intervention, a 10 minute intervention, um, has been associated with a decrease in implicit bias. Similarly, um, there was a recent study came out last year showing that mindfulness may actually help with the problem of stereotype threat by assisting um, those who might be likely to suffer stereotype threat in inoculating themselves against the risk of it. So there's this um, article by um, Wegner, it's called Mindful Maps, Reducing Stereotype Threat Through a Mindfulness Exercise. Um, that came out in 2012. So these are just a couple of examples of the way in which folks are beginning to turn explicitly to this intersection between mindfulness and contemplative practice and the ways in which they can actually help make our work in creating more effective learning communities for uh, diverse student bodies um, uh, more worthwhile for the students and more uh, uh, substantively um, uh, beneficial to them as well. So with that, I want to turn it over um, to Angela and invite her to share some of the ways in which she too has been working to bring these practices into. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us. And um, thank you, Rhonda, for those comments and Dan for bringing us together for this conversation. Um, I wanted to say a little bit since Rhonda opened by inviting us to think about why we're in this work. Um, why it matters. So I wanted to share a little bit about for what for me is the big picture and why I'm so excited about this convergence of different areas of theory and practice. Um, and then come back down to um, the kind of day-to-day -day reality, trying to use some of these practices in my classes and some of the struggles that I've had with them. And then we're going to kind of morph this into more of a conversation or a discussion, um, which we will invite you to join in as well. Um, so in terms of the big picture, um, I really think about this in connection with the idea of preparing lawyers to be peacemakers and to think about the, the positive ways that lawyers can contribute to social healing. Um, and it, one example, of course, is all of the chaos that we've re recently been through as a country around the events happening in Ferguson. And we repeatedly, regularly, have these crises, uh, whether it's around somebody who's been killed by the police, or it's been around a riot, or a high-profile murder, but we, uh, we, we often come to crisis in the United States around issues of race. And when that happens, there's usually somebody who calls for a conversation about race. So people always are calling for a national conversation. I think President Clinton was probably the most famous call, um, but other people do that as well. Um, but it seems that we're constantly calling for these conversations and then constantly failing at them. Um, they fall apart for various reasons, and I'm sure all of you can bring to mind situations where people tried to have a conversation of the kind of honest and rigorous type that's being called for, and then it kind of devolved into bad feelings and chaos and maybe anger. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we so often try and fail, I think, is that we are all easily triggered by race discussions, both people in the minority and people in the majority. And part of what I mean when I say triggered is that race discussions in particular are closely connected with our notion of social belongingness uh, in the United States. And Rhonda just talked about implicit bias and stereotype threat. And for people who are members of outgroups, 
um, conversations that talk about race or that are about race in mixed groups um, trigger a lot of those fears, a lot of those anxieties, um, the fear of being stigmatized based on stereotypes, the fear of being subordinated or put down. Um, and then for people who may be the in-group in that discussion, um, other kinds of fears pop up for folks. Fear of being stigmatized as a racist, which in this society at this particular time is one of the most terrible political sins that one can commit. Um, so there is a strong connection between race, between one's sense of identity and um, one's emotions. Um, and the other piece of being triggered is the body-mind piece, the simple fight, flight, freeze response in our body that takes place when our brains detect some kind of threat. And we know also from the research that the body interprets a social threat in exactly the same way that it would a physical threat. So our hearts race and the blood pressure goes up and the higher order thinking shuts down. Um, so to me, Rhonda's work is so important and this conversation we're having is so important um, because uh, it seems to me there's some kind of deep connection between the largest, most structural institutional problems of historical and present day racism in the United States and the most personal and deeply seated in our bodies and minds reactions and connections. Um, I was talking to a student from my critical race theory class last semester and she said, what I learned from the class is that the problems are structural and the solutions are interpersonal. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be careful about saying that, which is my, my first reaction to that comment was that I'm not sure that's exactly right. Um, that can easily turn into a situation in which we tell the anti-racist to slow, slow down, wait till the time is right, don't express your concerns in an angry way because we don't want to make people upset. Um, so I think, I think the comment shouldn't be taken in that way. Um, but I also think about Derek Bell's story of the racial data storm. Um, right, in which there's this magical reign of data that explains to every citizen in the United States the racial disparities, the historical story of how they came about, the trajectory of slavery to freedom for all of the relevant groups in the United States, you know, all of the information that we long to impart to our students, um, and nothing happens the next day. Life goes on just as usual. And Bell's point is that knowledge alone is not enough to lead us to change, to positive social change. There has to be something else, and I think that something else is deeply connected to this ability to center ourselves, to be able to hear things that might be challenging to us, to be able to sustain possible threats to our identity. And that is what brings me back to the importance of mindfulness, the broader sense, uh, and some of the practices that Rhonda is talking about that can bring us into the state of mind of mindfulness. Um, so that's kind of the big picture for me for why um, these conversations are so important, why it's so exciting to be bringing together the topics of teaching and learning and contemplation and social justice. Um, so just to bring it down to earth to the, the things that, that I do, um, I teach a couple of classes in which I'm um, trying to build these connections, and one of them is the very baby step um, practice in my criminal law class of doing something similar to what Rhonda described at the beginning of my class, just having a moment of silence, asking students to um, kind of shut out all the stuff that's been happening in their day until this moment, kind of let that be put aside for a moment and just come into presence and be here in this room right now for a few minutes before we enter into a discussion. Um, and I, like Rhonda, I don't really do much more than that. I don't try to guide them very much other than those very simple instructions. Um, I might suggest throughout the semester that this kind of sitting quietly can help you focus, can help you concentrate a little bit more. Uh, but I don't, I don't go much further than that. Um, probably my, my more uh, extensive foray into bringing some of these practices together is in my mindfulness and professional identity class, uh, which I'm teaching this semester at King Hall, uh, where we explicitly include some sitting 
in each class meeting at the beginning and again at the end. Sometimes we have more extensive guided meditation. Sometimes it's just a simple five-minute kind of sit. Um, and one of the continuing threads in that class is about exploring the connection between meditation as a practice um, and mindfulness, um, which I think of more as a stance toward life, um, characterizing very much the way that Rhonda just described it as the quest to become more aware, to pay more attention, to bring into consciousness many of the things that happen in our experiences, in our own minds that are unconscious or subconscious. And then secondly, to become more loving and compassionate, both toward each other and toward ourselves. Um, and then the second part of that is to ask, to what extent is that dual quest connected or not connected to becoming a lawyer? And so for these law students, often um, they may be convinced that when they get into practice, it's all going to come together. Um, more often they have some hopes and also some fears about whether they're going to be able to sustain this approach of compassion, especially toward their own lives as they move into practice and they're experiencing the demands and the stresses of being a professional and being at the bottom of the learning curve. Um, so part of the class is just about trying to give them the space to reflect on the education that they've received and the place that they are now in their trajectory as pre-professionals. People are about to jump into the world of being a lawyer and what does that mean with respect to who they are. Um, so in the class, we start out on the personal level as we're learning how to meditate and talking about some of the challenges of that. We talk about the stress response, the fight, flight, freeze response. Uh, we talk about stress management um, the ways to intervene in the stress response once it's gotten started, um, as well as the ways um, in which we can prevent the stress response from becoming toxic or taking over our lives. And we also talk about why it is that we don't do the things that we all know will prevent stress, why we don't get enough sleep, we don't eat right, and we stay up on Facebook instead of going to bed, and all of those things. Um, and then at the end of that unit, I asked the students to, um, to write a paper that's about their personal life and career journey that goes back to the moment when they were entering law school and they had their personal statement that tried to sum up who they were and why they wanted to go to law school and then compare that to where they are now and where they're expecting to be in a few years as they become professionals. So that's the first part of the course. Um, in the second unit of the course, we turn to interpersonal um, manifestations of mindfulness. Uh, and we talk about the theory of client-centered lawyering and the challenges, things that get in the way of making, building an effective connection to your client in the counseling context. Um, and there we do, um, we do talk about issues such as cultural competence. What does that mean? Um, is it about having a certain body of knowledge about this group acts like that? Or is it more, as I think, more about a, a kind of um, uh, an aspect of humility or um, a quality of being open uh, when things are not quite going right. We talk about listening. Um, we talk about emotional management, which as Rhonda noted is a huge issue. Um, and it's an issue for lawyers that we often don't talk about, but I think creates a lot of suffering um, in the lives of the lawyers that my students are seeing in, in their summer jobs and in their externships. And they talk about sort of the unhappy faces of the folks they're working for. And you know, where does that come from? Um, how do you manage that? Um, and then the third unit of the class is more institutional. And that starts to go uh, to move back outward toward the, um, the big picture that I started with, um, the institutional picture of how do we use the techniques, institutions, and practices of lawyering to heal society rather than deepen the divisions. Um, so part of that is talking about particular kinds of practice, such as restorative justice, um, such as transitional justice in the international con uh, context. And some of that is about regular, everyday, uh, lawyering practice, but done with a different type of intention. So people who are doing family law, but doing it with a more collaborative intention. People who are engaging in criminal practice and criminal defense, but with a very kind of thoughtful and loving 
stance toward their clients, for example, and people who are doing community law practice, again, with this very intentional and very well thought out and reflective attitude towards what it means to represent um, communities that are disempowered. Um, so that's the, that's the design of that class. Um, and um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about, in these classes, my efforts to bring mindfulness into discussions about race and then bringing race into discussions about mindfulness and some of the challenges that have come up for me and then um, maybe I can ask Rhonda how to solve them. <laughs> yeah. I'm, sure I have I'm sure she has all the answers in that paper. <laughs> on, the, on the first page, page one. <laughs> Just three page one. <laughs> so in terms of bringing mindfulness into discussions about race, one of the things I did in critical race theory, which I taught this past fall, uh, was we spent a, a day and I used a handout from a group that does diversity training called Thrive Social Justice, which was about um, things that go wrong in mixed race conversations. Um, and it talked about um, the kind of the different moves that happen. So person X says something that triggers person Y, trigger, uh, person Y gets upset and triggered and then re-triggers person X and then it goes down from there. Um, and jumping off of that handout, we talked about the stress reaction. We talked about fight, flight, and freeze. We talked about the things that it does in our bodies and also the things that it does to shut off um, our higher and more effortful um, systems of thought or styles of thought when one perceives that one is under attack. Um, and that that actually went really well and I found that although it was just one day of discussion, throughout the semester students kept coming back to this notion of buttons and triggers and recognizing that one of the hard things about having these conversations is that people get triggered and that how you know, thinking about how they might be able to intervene in that reaction when they sense it in themselves, as well as helping support the people that they're talking to um, and respond to them appropriately when it seems that they're getting triggered. So that was that was pretty successful. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, I, I thank you for sharing so much of, of your experience with this in ways that I think we can all kind of relate and we can all uh, empathize with and, and, and or sympathize. Um, I think that you were raising a lot of the kinds of questions that often we don't get into a conversation about the difficult, some of the difficulties, um, and some of those issues around our responsibility that emerge when we embark on this different way of teaching. Um, so a couple of things come up for me. One is this is actually not as easy as. It sometimes looks. It often actually doesn't look that easy. Right? <laughs> I think in this conversation, we can say, no, it, doesn't, it is not even looking very easy. But um, to the degree we can falsely think it's 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 you know something we can just sort of read a book about and um, take on um, uh, as we take on a lot of other intellectual subjects. Just you know, it's another thing we learn. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a misunderstanding of what this project is about. Um, I think your comments and the struggles you're describing really, on the one hand, underscore the importance of our own personal work. Mm -hmm. the, the centrality, I think, and I talk about this in my paper as well, probably should talk about it even more, probably should move it more to the front, <laughs> because I do think it's very, very important for us as teachers to see ourselves, see this as part of the ways in which we're ongoingly learning about our, not just our craft, but about who we are in the classroom and what um, what our own challenges are as we engage in these, these difficult subjects. But even when we've been at that part for a while, um, being vulnerable is always a challenging experience. So I, I mean, for me, having taught classes dealing with race and law for as long as I've been teaching classes on the torts, um, and by the way, using Angela's co-authored wonderful book as one of the resources that's really helped me be able to do that um, over the years. I I don't fall into this false sense at all that like it's going to be a piece of cake. It's never ever um, fully predictable how any new group of students is going to deal with any of these topics. Um, and so I think both um, humility, 
like a kind of a healthy uh, balance of, 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 of awe, if you will, for what it is that we're trying to do. Um, uh, a kind of a respect for our own ongoing courage in trying to do it, but also the challenges that are going to be inherent in that. And so having a practice of our own, I think, is so important. Um, and uh, But also realizing that we are talking about what in the literature, one of the things we're talking about is, is, is a way in which vulnerability has a pedagogical function. Um, and then, and there's a whole growing, emerging scholarship around something called the pedagogy of vulnerability that can help us think systematically about what it means to invite vulnerability into a classroom, but then what the responsibilities are to kind of protect that space. I talk to my students about wanting to make a space that is um, safe, but not always comfortable, right? And so I talk about um, vulnerability as being not weakness, but a path to strength. Um, but it is a path, and it's, it embodies a certain kind of, a, a kind of set, set of practices that help support us. I also want to say we're not therapists. So I think making some, being clear on what our role is um, to our students and to ourselves, how part of what we can do is identify when we might be a good resource to say you might need uh, more professional or more expert assistance working through this particular thing, there are ways we can say it. Um, and that has happened in my classes as well. I certainly have had students, I remember one semester in my contemplative lawyering class, I had a student who it turned out was really suffering the uh, post-traumatic, you might say, effects of having represented a client who, was, who had been by that time put to death. So this is all still while he was a student in law school and um, had, you know, enthusiastically gotten involved in this kind of public interest work and still wanted to commit himself to it, but was deeply, deeply, deeply affected by having wit literally been privy to a close relationship with a client who's been put to death. In that class, I was able to help him. First, I was present enough to him to see that he was struggling in that way and to have a conversation with him, which basically was about supporting him and Yes, this is a problem that's serious enough that mindfulness by itself isn't going to, it can help, but it's not really probably the full solution for you. So I do think we have to have resource around us and support um, in place so that we do know when it's time to sort of turn that person over and support them in getting deeper help. But I do think, yes, if we are doing the work ourselves, we're working on just whole, creating a space where suffering doesn't have to be fixed in that moment. Right, and so there's suffering and there's real, real suffering, trauma. If it's sort of the everyday life source of suffering that we know is part of the human condition and it's popping up and coming and ebbing and flowing in our classes, it's partly just really for me about how can we create a space where it can be okay for some of that suffering to emerge and we can stay together and to the place where we respond to it in various ways, not necessarily right in that moment, but we trust enough in the process that we can keep coming back. And that's what I'm often, that's a way of saying what I mean by the class is a safe one. Um, there might be a moment where we feel uncomfortable or even feel somewhat threatened, but ultimately I try as much as possible to sort of, I'm doing this because it's sort of, I feel like I'm, my role is to sort of throw a, a sort of a compassionate um, blanket, if you will, around us as we try to do this challenging work so that students feel safe coming back even if they had a moment where they didn't feel unsafe. But I honor and really, really by no means want to suggest that I think these are easy to do. One of my colleagues when I presented this paper at USF recently asked about the challenge Oh, and I think as a way of uh, your story is another example of this responding, for, for example, creating a space where people can feel free to say whatever they, what's coming up, what's rising, and yet recognizing that some of those things might make others feel unsafe. And so how do you both create an inclusive space on the one hand, but um, one where you can have accountability in that space, 
where you sort of name when, for example, something could be heard as a microaggression, uh, maybe unintended, but could be heard that way, and yet do so in a way that keeps the student who's been um, perhaps in that moment made to feel unsafe or chastened in a way that they didn't look for. Um, how do you make that person feel like this is still their home? And so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't have any great thoughts on that either. But I do agree with you that part of it is being centered in ourselves and being. Uh, you know, I, I think about the work that um, like Cliff Saron is doing with the Samatha project, and one of the things that he finds is that experienced meditators actually move towards suffering rather than away from suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think that as teachers, one of the things we can model is being able to move toward mm -hmm. instead of pull away and go, oh, you know, <laughs> something emotional happened here, yeah. better shut down, <laughs> time to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really being able to be with that and name it and say, you know, this is a really hard moment. Um, and um, and I, I definitely feel that I am much more able to do that the more that I practice than, you know, I could maybe a few years ago even. So I think that's, I think that is a big part of it. Um, but it does, it does, I think, make us, at least ma makes me think really deeply about what my professional responsibility is. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a much in some ways a deeper professional responsibility um, when you're teaching this way because you're you're really trying to connect to the whole student and not to just a small size of their brain mm -hmm. as we normally do in, in law school settings. Mm -hmm. But the rewards are often, I think, commensurate to that as well, that students come away going, wow, you know, someone really saw me, this was a safe space, you know, I don't really talk in law school classrooms, but here mm -hmm. I talked, you know, you also get that on the positive okay. side. Yeah. So it, I think it really is a, a combination. There's deep challenges, but deep satisfactions mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Shall we open it up for questions from the audience? Um, well, we don't actually have any questions just yet from the audience, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I have like some to, questions. You can <laughs> ask us some yeah, questions. Please, yeah. come join us. <laughs> please come join us. Turn this this way a little bit. So there you go. Um, I actually wanted to come back to your comments, Rhonda, while you were both sort of speaking about the inner work that mm -hmm. teachers need to do to, to be able to create these spaces. And I wonder if you could maybe one or both of you speak to that in terms of perhaps the, the, the work that you've done and, and what you kind of suggest um, for those of us who are, who are similarly trying to have that grounded space within ourselves to be able to create the stability for others to step into very potentially challenging emotional spaces. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly having a practice is, is integral to that, but beyond that, is there you know, particular inquiries that we want to be doing and, and questions to, that we explore to kind of mm -hmm. get to that place? Thank you for, for, for the question. Um, I, think, I think Angela and I have both spoken to the importance of compassion as a part of this you know, this infusion in particular, right? Mindfulness as an aid to doing um, work around social justice. Um, and I love that Angela pointed out something that I find to be so true. There's just so much suffering in the world generally, right? We know this. Um, and name your issue, bring it into the classroom, there's going to be suffering much more present around that issue than, than you might have even anticipated. Um, so I think compassion for self and for others is a really important uh, dimension of the work. Uh, so mindfulness, uh, sometimes the way mindfulness is introduced varies so widely right now that certainly there can be mindfulness uh, uh, trainings and int interventions and, and ways that people engage with something called mindfulness that is mostly about um, kind of a, a mental sort of a practice set of exercises that's mostly about calming the mind um, enhancing concentration and, 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 and heightening awareness of one's own inner perhaps experience but mostly it's about that compassion practices are often you know, maybe a part of the practice may, or maybe a part of the introduction into mindfulness, or may not be. For me, 
those have been extremely important elements of what I have relied on to deepen my own capacity and actually what I'm more and more offering to my students in law school spaces. So whether we're doing um, drop-in meditation sessions or I'm creating uh, an intentional um, mindfulness uh, exercise for one of my classes, um, more and more I'm including both self-compassion exercises to sort of model and frankly support myself as we engage in yet another conversation about Brown versus Board that every, <laughs> every time I read it, I'm still like, <laughs> in certain ways. But so self-compassion practices that I can use to, as a model and as a support for students. And then um, interpersonal compassion practices, starting with maybe just the simple practice known as loving kindness practice, where we um, explicitly invite reflection on a few traditional phrases that over time and millennia have been shown to support developing a sense of, well, friendly, if not loving, um, embrace of ourselves, each other, a, a broader and broader scope of humankind, you might say, and, uh, or, um, you know, all beings. So I do believe, yeah, specific compassion practices are very important. There are also trainings around um, interpersonal communication practice that in, in some ways infuse emotional intelligence, emotional social awareness, and mindfulness. And I've done some of those kinds of practices, and I think that can also be helpful, um, or some of those kinds of trainings. Um, but I just, I think, pe I want folks to be encouraged, because while it's not necessarily something we can pick up after one webinar, um, I do think, as Angela was alluding to, the payoffs are so great for a deeper engagement with ourselves as we do this work, with our colleagues, with our students, that um, for me, I see it as a lifelong kind of way in which a dimension of my work as a, a, a person who's committed to teaching for the rest of my life in one way or another. Um, and so if I'm gonna have as a, this is my lifelong work, then, you know, I can commit to lifelong practice around this as well. Yeah, I, I think everything Rhonda said is exactly right on, but it really points to the importance of compassion in what we teach when we teach mindfulness and not, you know, it's, it's in our secular world, it's much easier to sell focus, attention, you can study better, you know, those are, that's kind of the, the stuff that you reach for first, but I think the compassion, even though it seems mm -hmm. like at first that, oh, does this really fit in a law school classroom? Is this too mushy? Are people going to be turned off and roll their eyes? Ultimately, it turns out to be really the ground on which everything else rests. So I, I agree, it's it's really important. Um, and, you know, just speaking to the upside as well, um, for us, you, you, part of, or for me, um, part of what I get out of it as well is, is just hearing the incredible stories that people tell mm -hmm. um, in the classroom and, and outside of the classroom. Um, just the other day, last week, a student was talking in class about um, working in a criminal defense situation and meeting with this client who everyone was like, watch out for this client. You know, if he gets aggressive, just scream. <laughs> we'll come and open the door for you. <laughs> so he has to go in and face this person. Um, and then the way he talked to, about being able to diffuse this client just by listening mm -hmm. and realizing the client was telling him this long, completely, um, completely a lie, completely untruthful story about how he didn't do it, it was some other dude, you know. But the, but the student realized that the person needed to tell this story and needed to have the student listen to him. Yes. And then once he was able to tell the story fully the way he wanted to tell it and have the student go, okay, you know, and really feel like he had been heard, then he had established this bond and then he walked out of the, the cell and everyone else is like, he's never been that way. He's never been that calm. You know, he's always screaming at people. What did you do? Um, but just, a, you know, an incredibly inspiring story of what presence, just simple presence can do with other human beings, even human beings who are really broken and have done mm -hmm. horrible things. Right. So um, part of the, the joy of, teaching classes like that is getting to have discussions like that and hearing stories like that and being inspired again to do the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. so.
I, I also would encourage people to, to do it, even though it's not easy work. Mm -hmm. And of course, those stories have deep pedagogical value, right? They, they work on lots of levels. Mm -hmm. They work to make us feel more connected, see uh, the world through different lenses, but also um, they inspire, they teach substantive, you know, things that we need to learn to help us connect to the substance of issues we're learning mm -hmm. in a more vivid way. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're telling stories that have, you know, so many different ways mm -hmm. of having a positive impact on what we're doing in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I have um I have a follow up question. Uh, this is from Emily Dosko. And um, she's asking whether either of you have any suggestions for training beyond reading studying on my own uh, as a specifically trained to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, she's a practitioner, actually, and mm -hmm. just delving into okay. teaching now. So mm -hmm. Teaching generally, teaching law generally, or teaching, teaching mindfulness? Teaching mindfulness, mindfulness yeah. and law. Yeah. Yeah. You well, might yeah, I was just, um, there are uh, lots of different paths. Um, I started out by um, sort of um, expanding on some of the ways in which I, as a child, was exposed to what I now see as a kind of a, a bit of Christian mysticism in my own home. My grandmother had been called into the ministry. So I was exposed to a lot of sort of centering practice as a, as a young girl. And then um, over the years following graduation from law school, more systematically began to study just as really mostly a self-support, um, a way of dealing with the stress of my own transition from who I was before to this, this professional identity of a lawyer. I started uh, doing my own kind of uh, learning and practicing of basic meditation um, uh, and, and, and ended up studying a bit with um, uh, Norman Fisher and uh, sitting some with this group of lawyers who've been sitting for some time here in the Bay Area, um, a working group on mindfulness of law. And then ultimately though, um, also trained with the mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher training program that um, was developed by the University of Massachusetts under the direction of John Kabat-Zinn. So I've extensively trained in that particular uh, approach to teaching mindfulness, to moving from being a practitioner of mindfulness to being someone who is um, somewhat more comfortable with the process and practice of actually supporting creating spaces for learning around mindfulness and also really um, growing through mindfulness practice. So I think, I mean, I can personally recommend um, very very highly the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Teacher Training Program. Um, it's not, wait, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a program that you, you won't complete overnight, um, but I don't think this is the kind of program you should aspire to complete overnight, <laughs> as my other comments have already suggested. <laughs> Um, and, and in addition to that, the other resource that I found helpful is with, I always forget the name of the group that sponsors the summer workshops and retreats on contemplative teaching. Yeah. What is the... So there is an organization, the Center for Contemplative Mind, or another... I think that's what it is. I went yeah. to, um, so they're held at Smith College. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So yeah, so there is this organization called the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society. You may have one of their staff members on the line. I know someone was signed up to be here. Uh, from that organization, and I should say I've been affiliated with that organization for mm, a number of years as well. Um, so the center ha has as its mission at least one significant uh, aspect of its mission, and maybe the sole most central right now, to support faculty across various disciplines in developing as contemplative teachers. So people who bring these practices into particular academic disciplines. And um, so it's a place where you can definitely get support, get a, find yourself within a network of people who are doing this within law, um, but also across the disciplines. And that's a good opportunity to just you know, cross fertilize, learn from each other, um, explore some things. Um, and uh, so that is an organization we can make sure people have an opportunity. But the website of it is called contemplativemind.org. Um, and you can easily access their information on the web through that website as well. Um, and one of the things I like about those retreats that they have, I've been to a couple of week-long retreats, mm -hmm. is um, you also get a chance to practice some of the exercises um, as a participant. 
Um, so you kind of feel what they're like from the inside, and then you can take them with you and, and um, use them with students. So it's, it's really nice kind of balance of there's some little bit of lecture, but a lot of experiential learning, mm -hmm. which makes it very useful for somebody who's trying to, to find practices that they feel comfortable with adopting themselves. And I should say one of the founders of that organization was, is Charlie Halpern, uh, founder and um, founding director of the Berkeley Initiative for Mindfulness and Law. So the organization has long been um, engaged with issues of legal education and social justice as well. So. I'll just add my own recommendation for a, a resource, which is a facilitator's retreat at Spirit Rock Meditation Center here in Northern California which I think is now an annual retreat day. Um, it's in June this year. I did it last year. It's a week-long retreat, which combines about three days of a full retreat experience in silence and then three to four days of, uh, of training with three leading teacher trainers, um, Mark Coleman, Dinah Winston from UCLA, and uh, Bob Stahl of the MBSR program. So that's that's a great way to kind of dip your toe into the, the teaching world if, if you're new to it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll, we'll take just one more question. This one comes from Elise Kramer, who's at UPenn Law School. And she asks, any advice on introducing these practices, issues to a law school culture that isn't quite welcoming to this yet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that might refer to a lot of a <laughs> Yeah, lot of that's probably describes a lot mm -hmm. of institutions. Um, often it's, um, it's it's really just little baby steps, and if you can find even one other person who's interested, um, it can grow from there. Um, certainly at the University of Buffalo, SUNY Buffalo, where I first started teaching this with um, Stephanie Phillips, mm -hmm. uh, it was really Stephanie started out as the only person who was doing this stuff at all, and then she found an affiliate in the social work school, a friend of hers, Elaine Hammond, who was also very interested in mindfulness. Um, agreed to be a guest lecturer in the class that she was teaching. Um, and um, they taught that together, I think, a couple of times, and they still be teaching that now. Um, and then I was a visiting professor at the time, and so I co-taught with Stephanie, um, came to King Hall, and started looking around for who, you know, who might be an ally. And in my case, the first ally that I found at King Hall were, were, wasn't a faculty person, but rather the um, dean of students who again was kind of face to face with the amount of suffering and substance abuse and inappropriate behavior that often came out um, as a result of suffering on the part of students and thought wow this mindfulness stuff might really help this practical problem that we have with the students and so she was a huge source of support for me in starting to to build different um, classes and offerings around mindfulness um, and now Currently, there is another, now there's another faculty person who's interested, and she and I have started a weekly sit, and slowly, little by little, people are starting to drop in. And I, I, I find that often the first response from folks who are in law is sort of um, a little bit eye-rolling and derisive. Um, and so first, the first impulse is to giggle, and the second impulse is to say, I need that. <laughs> um, and so often the people who seem like they're really skeptical or you know, they're kind of rolling their eyes, you, you see them creeping around and they're like, well, what do you actually do? And can I come? And then in, in, little by little, it starts to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would I second everything just that Angela said in terms of the value of finding allies and um, developing a kind of a network of support as much as you can for this. Okay, so right. first, the first impulse is to giggle. And we're hearing a little bit of a take away over here. Um, but yeah, so just finding our allies, you'd be surprised. Most people, um, and myself included, when I first started trying to bring this at, into USF, probably back in 2007, I believe was when we first started, um, I thought there's probably nobody else who's interested in this, and of course found some people found a few couple of other professors we co-developed a course there called contemplative lawyering um but of course i was also networking with these other professors um outside of usf and then i think this idea of bringing in um people who are already doing it as guests as guest speakers not just in your classes but finding ways to have student organizations or others in the 
uh, organization, bring in somebody who, bring in Angela, <laughs> bring in somebody who's presented something, <laughs> right, and who's been doing it as a way of just helping support uh, development around that, and people are doing that around at law schools across the country. Well, that's a great note, I think, to close on, because our tentative next webinar is going to be on building a, a mindfulness program in law schools, including facing all the, the skepticism and institutional resistance, which pretty much inevitably arises. So we will explore that topic in more depth in the future. Um, but for now, I want to thank you all for tuning in, for watching this program, and thank Angela Harris and Rhonda McGee for their wisdom and insight. And we look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.